Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Today, my guest is Rick Nucci. Rick started two disruptive technology companies, the first one called Boomi. He ended up selling to Dell Corporation. Can't wait to hear the intro and the details behind that. And then in 2013, Rick started and co-founded Guru, uh, an enterprise software company based in Philadelphia. Welcome, Rick. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, excited to chat. Great. Rick, um, love to know a little bit about your background. Where are you from? Where were you raised? Early role models, big influences on your life. Yeah, totally. Uh, I grew up in uh, um, outside of Philadelphia in uh, the Lancaster area um, in a town, town called Lebanon. Um, uh, it, 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 for those not familiar, there's a big, big kind of Amish uh, uh, presence around that area. If you've never actually been been been, been it, uh, uh, absorbed into that, um, it can be a very interesting experience for first time visitors who co come and visit me. But um, yeah, grew up there, and then um, and then actually went to Penn State and. Um, graduated um you know I, I graduated with a business logistics degree but as i was wrapping up my time at penn state i was like oh man technology is really the thing i'm interested in um and uh so is 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 starting a business um and and fortunately ended up getting a job at a business logistics software company so i could sort of leverage my my degree but kind of immerse myself in technology which is really what i wanted to do and so i got that job at a software company that was based here in philadelphia um, and then, um, spend a few years there before, um, before starting Boomi. Um, the final thing I'd say about influences, I mean, both of my parents were, um, business owners. And so I think to some degree that normalized the idea of starting a company. It felt like something that, you know, happened in, in my family and my parents were both small business owners working really hard to, you know, to build, build the businesses that they build. And I sort of saw that. And, um, I think it, I don't know at the time that I would name that as inspiring, but as I look back, I was like, yeah, definitely. I think it kind of made it feel, um, more, more normal. Like I said, so you're in Penn State University, you get involved in technology. What is it about technology that fascinated you? What was the magnet, the draw there that just sucked you right in? Well, I think it was, I think the first impressions were all around the ability to do um, old things in new ways. I mean, you know, like, like e-commerce was like one of my first moments, like I'm a big music person and I still remember um, buying CDs on cdnow.com. Um, and, you know, like sitting in like the computer lab at Penn state, like, you know, I'm sure I'm not supposed to be using it for this purpose, using like a very early Netscape browser going on this website and being like, click, click buy and being like, oh my God, that was like the easiest thing I've ever seen in my life. And then just, I think really became fascinated with how it worked. I always liked tinkering with things and um, I just really gravitated very quickly to technology and the idea of the internet and the World Wide Web. And even growing up when I was really little, my parents got me computers when I was little. And, you know, some of those things were like put the phone on the, you know, put the phone into the thing to like make the internet connection. And the whole concept just always blew my mind. So I think I sort of got into that and just kind of never really looked back. Um, and, um, you know, went back to school after graduating to learn um, how to be a developer and like things like that and just kind of stuck with it ever, ever since. And, and what was it that sparked the idea for your first business, Boomi? What, Boomi. How'd that come about? Yeah, there were, there were three, three founders um, and we all worked together at this logistics software company. And as we were, um, 
building this product and customers were deploying it, um, you know, let's say like a Hewlett Packard is going to buy this logistics product to help them optimize the way orders are picked and packed in their warehouse. You know, people are buying printers and cartridges and all the, what's the most optimal way to do that. Right. And you know, that, that world's <laughs> quite different now, but back then that was the, that was the, the product they had. And what we observed was the data connections between this product and the order management systems and the retailers that were make that were placing orders with Hewlett Packard to stick with our example, you know, was so complicated and so custom coded and so um, brittle in that it would often break. And we saw this happening over and over again and felt like, hey, this is a product opportunity. This this doesn't, why does this need to be something that has to be custom coded over and over again? Um, you know, there, there's a better way kind of thing. And, and we left this company um, on very amicable terms. They ended up being a big partner for Boomi um, and, and, and started Boomi with the goal of, you know, productizing this problem of integration, application integration. How do you make it easy to connect the data between these different systems together to, you know, automate a business process? And, and how, did, how did you know that you're onto something here? What was the insight that said, we've really got something we can really expand and scale into well, this market? Well, the, um, you know, this was 2000 that we started and, that first premise um, actually did not work. And so um, there was never a question that this was a must solve problem for businesses ever. That was that that never was and I think never will be <laughs> a, a matter for Boomi. Boomi Boomi runs today as its own business and Dell sold it uh, to private equity uh, a couple of years ago and it's now its own independent business again. And I, I don't think I don't think a boomie's ever going to have to convince a business that this is a must solve problem. The issue in those early days was that when we got into it, we were like, oh, there's like a hundred companies doing this. And there are bigger venture backed companies doing this. And Microsoft launched a product that had a very similar premise to what we were trying to do. Microsoft, obviously much larger tech company, even back then. Um, and so, uh, we pivoted the business meaningfully and the Boomi 2.0, which is the Boomi that everybody knows today, um, had a very different premise. And that premise was still rooted in this application integration problem. But what we said was, if um, the cloud thing is real, again, this is 2007. So cloud was being actively dismissed by people who I think in hindsight were threatened by it. But, you know, it's a fad. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. It was unproven, blah, 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 blah. Um, we said, okay, but if it does work, if we see, if companies replatform and they go from on-premise software where they're installing and maintaining all this software on their premises, on their own servers, to the cloud where they are licensing subscriptions from software service providers, the way that integration works, technically speaking, will have to be completely reimagined. And we said, okay, let's imagine that future. Let's build a product for that future and take that to market. We went from a hundred competitors to three. And that's um, mm -hmm. when we knew we were onto something, when we started seeing the early rapid adoption of um, that product to companies that were starting to buy salesforce.com and NetSuite and Marketo and Concur, what I would call all of these SaaS 1.0 companies, um, Taleo, success factors, they all had must solve integration problems. We could go to them and say, hey, we can solve this problem for you in a very elegant way that is a cloud native architecture. And that really was what took Boomi off into the business that it is today was, again, really pivoting the premise of like, we're going to go after this different problem space. It's still integration, but quite different in what, what, it, what it's actually, um, how we're actually solving it. Yeah, so exciting story. You build it up. You had to make some transitions, fine tune it for the market, if you will. 
where did selling the business enter your mindset? We had um, inbound interest from a big cloud provider um, that was, I would say, unexpected. They were a partner, a close partner. We were building some pretty deep um, technology together because they really wanted to be able to bundle Boomi into their their offering to help customers solve these problems and said, you know what, this would work way better if we just acquired you guys. And we said, okay, unexpected, you know, um, this was a conversation with the co-founder of the company, unexpected. And so um, we, we actually had a um, partnership also with Dell. And um, when we shared with them that this was likely going to happen, they sprung into action and long story short, basically (laughs) said, you know, we didn't really want this to be a partnership either. We think what you're doing is very strategic to how we want to, to grow Dell and, and Dell really at the time was starting to get serious about business software and viewed integration as a key thing. And long story short, Dell was just very serious about wanting to have this technology. And so, um, ended up acquiring the business and that was in, um, 2010. So unexpected inbound, but I think through the process, um, there was the obvious financial no brainer for the investors and the shareholders, um, but also our belief was that Dell was going to kind of protect the boomy business and keep fueling it and investing in it so that it could continue to be a product that could solve a real problem. And that, that, that has very much happened. I, I always give huge credit to Dell for being um, a good acquirer in terms of, you know, doing the things they said they were going to do. Um, and so and so I think in that in, in many regards, it was it was really great um, from that standpoint. But yeah, that was kind of how it how it played out. So in many ways, you actually lived the American dream. You had an idea, you started the business. You went through the ups and downs, the emotional turmoil, the journey, but you actually got to do the exit. What were the emotions that you felt as you were going through that exiting process? Uh, it's really weird. It, the, the thing that's really weird, um, and many, many founders talk about this, but you have more of an identity connection with your business. I definitely did, but I hear this over and over again. I had more of an identity connection with Boomi than I realized. And by identity connection, what I mean is you feel a bit of a sense of loss after the acquisition. And that is a completely absurd statement to make. I fully, fully own that, right? Because you're like, well, you know, But there's all this financial outcome and, you know, really great things happened to all the employees at Boomi and blah, blah, blah. And that is all true. But there is there is a a thing I think that exists within me and still does with Guru where um, there's just that connection. And so there was a little bit of that kind of sense of loss. And and, 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 and as I think about the, the things that got me stirred up when I was now a Dell employee, I look back at them again, starting a second business, and I'm like, boy, that really didn't matter. It's really fascinating that that got me worked up because it just doesn't matter. Like, you know, <laughs> like having to move from like, you know, Microsoft, like Gmail back to Microsoft Outlook. Oh my God, I can't believe, you know, like that's, that's, that's you know, that's a very trivial example. This is like the stuff that was mattering, you know. Um, was just really weird. So yeah, there was an adjustment period and a reflection I think about there um, for sure. And then I remember leaving when I left Dell um, because I wanted to start Guru. It was a very emotional thing to leave. You know, it's you know 13 years of your life, but it's 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 more it's more than just a job. You know, I think is is really um, a lot of what it comes down to. Um, so yeah, I think the the emotional part is a very fascinating thing. You don't necessarily see it coming, but then when it happens, you're like, whew, boy, that's uh, there's an identity shift here thing. Like I, uh, I, I, I matter re- <laughs> without, without needing to be affiliated with another company. Um, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I realized something very similar. My brother and I started a business and we ended up selling it to long story. We ended up selling to iron mountain corporation. Yeah. 
And I didn't think I had an identity wrapped around the business until we signed the final contract. And obviously the good feeling of the sale, it was successful and everything. But about two months later, I called an employee who did not return my phone call. And it was an eye opener, like, oh, gee, I wonder why they didn't call, my, call me back. And I realized my identity's changed. I'm not the same person to them that I was in running the business. So after yeah. you sell to Dell yeah. and you go through that euphoria and that really, really nice experience, three years later, I believe you started, co-started another business. Yes. What made you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, well, I, I think I had, I think I decided I wanted to start another business just sort of generally speaking. I think it was obviously either I forgot about all the really hard parts, um, and only remember the good stuff, or I just was like, um, this is kind of like, I did this for 13 years. I'm not really sure what else I would, I would do, you know, anyway. So there was sort of that, like, I want to do this again. And then, and then I think it was like, well, what would it be? And I think, I think there is a like when you've personally lived a pain, um, it does short circuit, I think, a little bit of like the um, validation of the problem because you experience it firsthand. So you understand it in a bit of a deeper way. And I think that was really what what definitely what played out at Guru and and a lot of the the things I um, the, the very specific pains were. Um, there was a, there was a big change management event, which was M and A, and after the after the acquisition, there was a massive knowledge transfer that needed to happen, where you had a um, team of Boomi employees, um, and then you had a hundred thousand employee, you know, large corporation of Dell, and there needed to be a very efficient way to enable the go to market of the Boomi product and um, how it works and how to position it and um, how to support the product, how to implement the product, how to position it against competitors, all of this know-how. And we tried buying wikis and we tried standing up um, SharePoint sites and we tried building intranets and we tried using uh, chat tools, way precursor to Slack. Um, and none of the employees were using them. They just, they, what, what they, what they did instead is they would, they would call me or they would call, um, someone on leadership and they would ask the same questions over and over again. How do, how do I position against this competitor? Or, you know, how does this part of the product work? And I think we really saw how it inhibited, um, our revenue because we were not, because we were not activating the knowledge of the product and what it could do in a scalable way, we were missing out on these sales opportunities, um, within Dell's customer base. And, um, because we tried using all of these other products, um, and saw how they didn't work, that gave us the, like, there has to be a better way moment. And, 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 and Mitch, Mitch and I, um, then, that then, then left and started Guru. Mitch and I were working together. He ran engineering at Boomi. And so we had worked together for many years. He also personally lived his version of this pain. Um, mm -hmm. and so that was the, that was sort of the moment to say like, yeah, this like matters. This is another must solve problem. This matters. We should, we should kind of go and do this. Okay. So you start the business, you get it up and going, what's changed? Did the product change as you got into the market? How did the company evolve to its present stage? Yeah, totally. Lots of change. I mean, it's, you know, I think we've been in market for, for eight years. Um, like, like a, we've had a product to sell for, for eight years. The biggest change without a doubt is generative AI, without a doubt. And I do liken that to the replatforming moment of cloud. Um, and the hype cycle that followed it and the eventual change that ended up happening that was hugely consequential, not just for, for businesses I was involved in, but the entire industry, um, that is now happening again. And um, generative AI in our category um, is, is, is hugely, hugely consequential. And so, you know, really today... Um, we are fulfilling the promise we've always wanted to fulfill with Guru, which is 
to enable every employee to be able to go to a place to search, ask the questions they have and get the knowledge they need to do their jobs. If, you know, I'll give you a few quick examples. Like if you are a CEO at a company, you probably want to know what's going on with a certain customer, what's going on with a deal, what's going on with a certain customer. And to get that answer today, that knowledge, you have to go into CRM systems, you have to go into call recording software, you have to read support tickets, you have to read notes from the customer success person, um, you have to dig around chat um, conversations of that customer. Wildly inefficient. And so you don't, you just go ask someone, right? And, and they're busy and then they, they prepare you a digest because you're the CEO, right? And so like now you can ask that question to Guru. Guru has brought together all of those systems, any system in a company that has knowledge. It could be a meeting recording. It could be a CRM system. It could be a knowledge base. It could be a uh, conversational channels like Slack or Teams, wherever there is knowledge being uh, in, organically exchanged through conversation, whatever it might be. We pull all of that together. We make sense out of it and can give that CEO back that, right? So that might be what a CEO cares about. If you're in customer service, what that leader cares about is time to first response, average handle time. I'm not talking deflection where there's a whole other AI world that is creating conversational things. I'm talking about the humans that have to get involved to help sell or service something for, 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 for a potential customer. Those folks need fast, accurate answers, and they are measured on how much they can do in a day, how quickly they resolve issues, what's the CSAT of the conversation they had. So those support, those support leaders are going, I need a source of truth for my org so they can go to one place and get all their product answers and status of bugs, whatever it might be, and be able to get all of that in one easy place. A final example I'll give you, if you're in HR, very seasonally relevant right now. Every HR team's thinking about their health insurance plans for next year. There's benefits enrollment happens every single year. This is one of those change management moments that generates an enormous amount of knowledge transfer. You've got new plans you're offering or pricing changes. You have three options you could pick from. It's weird acronyms most employees don't understand. So what do they do? They just go bury the people team in questions, mm -hmm. right? And so now with Guru, we're connecting your handbook. We pull in the PDFs of the insurance plans. Um, we pull in the talk tracks of the people leaders and pull that all together. And now the employee can go, here's what I have. Why would I switch? And it will go, oh, well, you're married. You have two kids. This is your plan now. Um, this new plan would offer you the following and can actually give you that, you know, that knowledge and insight. So those are the those are the um, problems we solve today. If you asked me, you know, three years ago before we were um, building deeply into Gen AI, I would have given you a um, what an answer that would sound much more rudimentary because the technology has enabled a radically mm -hmm. better way to solve this problem that that otherwise you have to hunt and peck and kind of pull it all together yourself. So I'd say that's the biggest change that we that we see now is the impact generative AI has on our category of, uh, of software. Okay. What's the difference in the experience of running and scaling a business between Boomi and Guru? Between running and scaling a business, um, I think there's... Um, there's the there's the benefit of having done it before and 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 trying to only make new mistakes. Mm -hmm. So so that's a huge one. And so I think that we did a much better job at recognizing the importance of company culture and um, defining company culture by writing down core values and then um, obsessively building rituals around manifesting them inside the company and. The real reason or benefit or payoff that has when you're intentional about your culture is it builds trust between the employee and the company relative to what it might be otherwise. It also establishes a compatibility between the employee, their styles, and what the company believes it wants to be successful. It doesn't really matter what your core values are as long as you have them and have an identity or sense of purpose. Because I think Boomi's culture was at the its its 
it's very, very good, but I think it was accidentally good um, because we, um, we, we made, I think, some really wonderful hires um, and really wonderful leaders who then brought their culture in. Um, but it's accidental because the, uh, the opposite can happen. If you bring a cultural incompatible leader in, guess what? That's going to be instilled you know, down the team. So culture and recognize the importance of that. I think that's a big one. I think um, another another big one, and it's, it can be hard to put into words sometimes, but we have a core value called embrace the journey. And really what that is, is like, you, you know, you were describing, you said, you know, Boomi was the American dream. And then you quickly said, you know, with the ups and the downs. And I think that can get lost on people. It's easy to read uh, articles covering companies that show headline metrics and be like, whoa, up and to the right. Wow, look at that thing. Mm -hmm. And that really is never the story. And the story really looks like this mm -hmm. big squiggly line. And so one of uh, Mitch and I's goals with Guru was to normalize that feeling a little bit and make it clear that um, a moment like a pandemic can have a global impact in Guru sphere, both our employees being like, what the hell's going on to our customers going, we're not buying anything because we don't know what's going on and not having that melt down the entire company. And it really did. It was an amazingly resilient team through that. And I'm just picking one, let's call it black swan event, right? But there are these moments that happen all the time. And I think when you're, you're, you establish a bit of normalcy and that embrace the journey, then your emotions don't go like this with every good and bad thing that happens. Instead, you sort of go more like this. And, 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 mm -hmm. and that creates endurance. And I think endurance is something that um, I think we really pride ourselves on at Guru. We, are, we operate with high urgency, but we're also patient. We, we, we really try to combine those two things. And so you really got to have endurance and grit, you know, for that to like work. So I think that's another difference I would call out that like at Boomi, I was just walking into these things, having no context or prior experience. And then, you know, working with my team to kind of navigate through them the best we could. Um, and so I tried to reflect on that a bit and be like, all right, let's try to Let's try to bring a little calm to the chaos that we know this thing's going to be, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Give us an example, if you can, of how you are using, you have five core values, how you use them to guide decisions, evaluating performance, just directing the business in those difficult times. Yeah, totally. So absolutely. So we have, um, we have, uh, a core value called give and receive graciously and give and receive graciously is all around operating with radical candor. Radical candor is a framework that um, uh, Kim Scott wrote a book on it and it's become a quite popular concept. And basically um, radical candor says it's a quadrant and it basically plots everyone's behavior in one of four quadrants. And so the good quadrant where you want to be, is that you are both challenging directly the person you're working with and you care personally about their success. If you're challenging someone directly and you don't care about their success, that's called obnoxious aggression. And I would hazard a guess to say that everyone has interacted with someone like that. And it is demotivating. It does not lead to better outcomes for team or project or whatever you're working on. The other end of that is if you care personally, but you're not challenging directly, that is called uh, ru uh, ruinous empathy, ruinous empathy. Mm -hmm. And I think that is toxic to a company culture because you create a culture of cheerleading and you're always trying to find the good things and you're not actually giving someone the feedback they need to get better. And um, I would say that every company... Um, is imperfect or maybe said better every company slides into one of those those zones right and the fourth one is called manipulative insincerity where um you're actually telling the person this is great but actually your actions are actually quite corollary to that and so um you know you you kind of kind of plot yourself on where you are and then try to move to get better and that's what we did and so so when guru messes up in our quadrant we slide into ruinous empathy um, that is partially because 
um, I saw the obnoxious aggression behavior and I made a choice. I said, that's my trade off. That is much more damaging to a company and to a set of humans working um, when someone shows up with obnoxious aggression behavior that um, that's my trade off. So I will take the risk that someone will slide into ruinous empathy and then find ways to bring them back. I personally, when I personally make mistakes in the quadrant, I slide into, into ruinous empathy. And so we do two trainings a year to get more tactical to your question. We actually hire the radical candor folks and we ask them to do workshops with us twice a year to reinforce to the team that this matters and this is how we're going to operate and it manifests in how we make decisions. But it also just is, it has these micro effects every single day where, um, you just feel more comfortable saying the thing you're thinking and you don't feel like you have to, you know, uh, hold it back or hide it. You know, we have to learn how to do these things. It, it, it is, you know, many of us were raised, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Right. Which is really terrible advice. Like you actually mm -hmm. don't, shouldn't be programmed that way. If you have something to say, like, don't be a jerk, but like say the thing, help the person, right? They, they probably right. want that feedback. So, so I'd say that's a really good example of something we have done for, I don't know, going on five years now where we have this um, company that comes in and does this training and just, just relentlessly trying to reinforce this behavior we want to model. And then we manifest it in our core value called give and receive graciously. Good. So, how did you come about the insight that culture is really important and um, you wanted to learn more about it and get it deeply ingrained in the everyday behaviors of your people? Um, it was, it was the, it was the reflection that at Boomi, it was accidentally good. Um, and it is very good. But at least in my t my tenure there, I think it was accidentally good. And I saw when we made some misfires um, and the resulting consequence of that. And I also I also um, saw and this was something we did at Guru as well. When we became multi office at Boomi, um, which was uh, Philadelphia and San Francisco, which Guru became Philadelphia and San Francisco as well, um, mm -hmm. that that's another culture moment where if you haven't written them down, um, what happens is your offices get their own subcultures, which can be accidentally great or accidentally really not good at all. Mm -hmm. And so with Guru, we said, let's get ahead of that. I remember we closed our series A, it was like 2017. And we knew we were going to open this office. And we said, okay, it's time to write these down. Because as we are opening the second office, Let's have this V1 of the core values written down so that every new hire starting that isn't sitting in the room in Philadelphia every day um, is going to see them. And then, of course, as we've shifted to more of a remote business where people are just sort of all over now, um, all the more reason to, to, you know, to have these values written down and, and, and defined. And it's, it's built into our interview process. It's built into our performance review. Every town hall we do, we celebrate values in action. You know, we just have all of these rituals now that we've just built up um, over the years, but that's really why it's like a moment of change, opening the second office, new employees. Let's make sure we're intentional about defining these core values, which again are, characteristics or behaviors that we want to see. It's not that we want people that are like us, not at all, actually. Um, it's that we want people that have behaviors that are compatible with the way we want to operate as a company. That was really the, the thing, the purpose of the core values. So, so yeah, that was the, the, that was the moment for Guru, I'd say, that second office. Yeah, I concur with that. We found we had 13 offices, and if you didn't have a common culture between the th the, all 13 offices, it was a jungle out there and <laughs> impossible to yeah. communicate and keep the organization in focus. One of your core values I find interesting, don't take yourself too seriously. In an environment of high technology where you're moving fast and scaling, you got 150 employees now, I believe, based in Philadelphia. How do you keep people humble? What are the practices around don't take yourself too seriously? Yeah, I appreciate that. It's a, it's actually a phrase that one of my first, he was like Boomi's first investor and like one of my first kind of mentors. 
And every time we'd walk into an interview, he'd be like, just make sure they don't take themselves too seriously. And the best example I can give you of what that means is um, when you debate someone, are they debating with you because they want to be right? Or are they debating with you because they want to get to the right answer? And we are looking for the latter. And the former behavior tends to close out alternative points of view. You become closed and critical and your, and your goal or your motivation is to get what you want. And I don't think that is best for any company to build the best product or achieve the goals that they want to achieve. I think the best behavior is people who are, it's effectively a ego, you know, how prominent is ego in your motivations and operations as a human? We all have them. So we need to own that, but like how prominent is it? And are you able to hear something and go, that's a phenomenal idea. I had nothing to do with that idea, but we're going to do that. And that person had that idea. And like, those are the decision makers I want at the company that don't have any of this kind of not invented here syndrome, right? That's another way to kind of look at it. Um, you know, I think if someone feels that like ideas are currency, then they're going to value themselves based on if they come up with the ideas. I think that is very, very dangerous because I think what you really want is someone who goes, I'm going to get I'm going to get these sources of inputs and I'm going to pull out the best idea regardless of where it came from. So that debate to get to the right answer behavior, and it's something you really can test for. Um, is really what we, how we manifest the don't take yourself too seriously core value. And I can tell you when you have a team that is functioning that way, it is about the lowest drama interaction you could hope for. You can put a hard thing mm -hmm. in front of a team like that and they're going to be like, they're just unflappable. They're just going to be like, all right, well, um, should we try this? You go, well, um, I don't think that was that. Yeah, you're right. All right. Well, maybe that would work. You know, you, you just cut through all of this, um, drama that I've just seen in so many other team environments. Um, yeah, I, I really, I really love that core value as you can probably tell. <laughs> Let's say that you have an employee as an example and some employees, the way their mind works, uh, they get insights and ideas from other people. They put them in their own words, and all of a sudden, they become the, uh, the originator of that idea, and they don't give credit. In a culture where people don't take themselves too seriously, how do the other people out to that person, or I'm going to say give them supportive input that maybe the way they're acting isn't in conformance to what they, other, everybody else wants? Totally. If that does happen, I would say you are taking yourself too seriously <laughs> if you're not giving mm -hmm. the credit to where the credit's due. I would see the yeah. general behavior you see around Guru is our team members almost go out of their way to be like, oh, Jess had this great idea for this thing. And so I think it oftentimes doesn't happen. But I think when it does happen, it's a radical candor moment. I look to our leadership team to model the right behavior, but also be able to go, hey, who are you shouting out for this thing we're going to announce in town hall? Who are you going to thank and shout out? And, and, and that is a way to say, um, the answer shouldn't be no one. It was all me, right? The answer should be, yeah, it is actually part of our interview process too. We actually, we actually test without getting too specific. You know, we actually test for the way people talk about their accomplishments and their prior roles and how those accomplishments manifested. And what we're listening for is an authentic example of where they realized that they couldn't have done it without that other person, you know? And so, so, so that's generally how we approach that is we, we, we build the, you know, we build the communication processes around things that we're doing to innately say, like, I want to thank X for coming up with Y. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think we generally, as a result, very rarely see idea hoarders. Um, yeah. So you walk your talk of what you're saying. That's, yeah. and that's what makes it all happen in technology. Things happen so fast. The change in technology, and particularly with AI coming in, pretty radical speed of change. How do you how do you stay on top of that? How do you keep your product 
up to date or a step ahead of everybody else, which is extremely difficult to do. How do you do that? Yeah, I, um, I would agree with you that it is extremely difficult to do. I think there is, to, to give some context to, I think, your question, or at least how I think about the context, is one of the things that makes it really hard is you have a hype cycle happening. And hype cycle is a phrase, I believe, coined by Gartner, at least that's where I first learned it, which is that every technology goes through a peak of inflated expectations and then a trough of disillusionment. And right now in generative AI, either either we're just doing that, either it's happening constantly or, you know, because like a new thing comes Mm -hmm. out and, you know, um, so there's so much noise and Unlike prior hype cycles, this one is in the midst of a globally reaching set of uh, communication platforms and technologies like X and LinkedIn, where people can 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 communicate out things more than ever. So you have even more noise, and that and 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 that's sort of I think the backdrop. And then you'll start to see practitioners build. AI demos that sh- that that in the 10 minute video are amazing. And you're like, I must have this. And then you try to actually use it and, and it doesn't work. Right. And so I think what, at least the way we thought about it and the decisions we made is we're going to look at all of these new technologies with a complete open mind. We are not, we are not going to do bleeding edge implementations of technologies because we sell products that employees rely on to get knowledge they need to do their jobs. And so if we screw that up and we give those employees the wrong answers and the wrong information, it has a very high consequence. And so I would much rather not be the first one to come out with some leading edge AI thing, but instead get it right so that mm-hmm. when an employee is using it, its quality and accuracy is, is much is much higher. So that's sort of like mindset one. Mindset two, from a technology perspective, is giving our teams permission to um, put their hands on new technologies, new AI technologies, and experiment with those. And that's, of course, LLM models, which are changing very quickly, trying competitive LLMs, but it's also trying new techniques around retrieval augmented generation or new techniques around, um, you know, human computer interaction. You know, literally two days ago, Anthropic announced, you know, a model that's able to manipulate a mouse and a keyboard, um, you know, virtually speaking, to help create a whole new kind of automation. Right. And so 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 we we combine both of those things become true for us. We're going to try all the new things. We're going to jump into them. We're going to see how they could apply to what we do. We also are going to hold the bar higher and say that we, we will hold back on something um, if it is not going to work at scale in a, in a complex business environment and, and, and combine those two things together. And then the third thing I would tell you is like, um, and this is maybe true for someone who is not starting today. If you're starting today and you don't have an install base and an existing product, um, you have a different set of hard things to figure out. But one thing you don't have is what do I do with my current product? Um, and like we did with Boomi, you know, we will do major surgery. We will not just put the shiny AI button on top of the non AI product and say, we now are AI powered because customers are going to see through that in 10 minutes and it's going to be novelty AI. It's not going to actually move the needle. And so when we find something that meets both criteria, exciting new technology will work for business, we go all in. And that means we will uh, disrupt and rebuild and rethink very meaningful parts of our product in order to bring that to life. And so I think a lot of that is born out of our experience biases from Boomi, where we were building in a platform reshift like we're having now that that time it was on prem to cloud um that is the same sort of mindset i think we have now um to to your point it moves really fast and so we uh want to take advantage of our ability to move with agility and speed um but that doesn't always mean that that it's who's announcing the new thing first and the industry's first and the industry's first everyone's doing everything right now. So Mm -hmm. like if if a customer really is keeping score on who was first on something, kudos to them, but I couldn't imagine you could possibly do it. Mm -hmm. I think it's the first good functional value providing thing. And that might mean it's the third or fourth thing that gets quote unquote announced um, to exist. And so that's, that's been our mindset. Um, It's early days, but I, I think we did see some patterns of success with that approach at Boomi. 
Today, we have unbelievable, fierce pace of change disruption. Uh, if you can't keep up with the pace of change, you're obviously behind the curve. You're getting into trouble. That elicits and triggers a lot of different emotions. Trigger the different emotions that come through change, the fear, the apathy, the anger, all of those types of things. Where do you see the place for emotional intelligence in today's businesses? Oh man, it's like, it's like higher than ever. I was saying this the other day, like we've been talking about culture and I'm going to connect the dots between culture and AI, because, um, if you ever want to hire business ROI on culture and why defining it is important, that moment's happening right now. And so we, um, we just finished, um, four city, uh, customer in-person customer events. Um, meeting with hundreds of our customers in different places around the U.S. And one of the questions I asked every time was, how many of you are using ChatGPT at work for some sort of work-specific task? How many hands go up? 80% of the room hands go up every single time. Follow on The follow-on question, that, not, that doesn't happen in the open room, but they're customers so we know, um, which is how many of you have deploy have your companies deployed and sanctioned ai use and it's flipped it's 20 percent. and so there's two things kind of playing out that trigger this emotional intelligence point number one is that there are employees using ai way more than companies realize and probably doing not great things with the data not because they're being bad actors but because they're like i can't wait i want to get work done this stuff actually works. I need to get going, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is definitely happening. And if companies create a culture of fear or a culture of job insecurity because they posture that AI is going to allow them to remove hundreds or thousands of jobs, then the behavior that you're going to see, because human beings, I tend to believe, are very smart, is they just won't tell you that they've got a breakthrough on an AI that they figured out through personal experimentation that can help teams work three times faster. Why would they be, why would they be compelled to possibly share that if it could either get them in trouble because they're misusing AI or could get that their job threatened because, oh, great, now we can shrink this department from X down to Y. And so I think there's, there is a moment of trust between companies and employees to say, we know that experimentation rooted in real business problems is how we're going to make AI work for our company. So we're going, to, we're going to have an AI policy that's clear and transparent, but that the policy exists to encourage experimentation in a safe way, not scare you off from doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And then also that we are going to encourage the use of AI to make our existing team be able to do X percentage more of what they could do before, which is quite different than saying, we're going to use AI to eliminate this X percentage of our team. Nobody wants to participate in that. There are stories of it happening, but no, no one's waking up every day getting excited about that. So I think we're at a moment where a, a company that is going to thrive in AI really moving the needle for their business and its ability to operate will be the ones that have the culture of trust and empower their teams to do this safe, responsible use of AI to help them experiment towards making their business problems uh, or, or, their, or their business needs work in this like step-changing kind of way. Mm -hmm. With in working with emotional intelligence, one of the big problems is how do you put metrics around it? Have you given any thought to that? Um, I don't know. I don't know that it's something that can be measured per se. Um, I do think it is something that you can interview, and I think it is something that you can teach. And um, I would say that the radical candor framework is an exercise in emotional intelligence. We've used other frameworks in the past at Guru. Um, conscious leadership is another one that is effectively cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's really all rooted in emotional intelligence and helping people be able to process hard things better. Um, so 
I don't know that it can be measured, but I do believe it can be taught. And I do believe that there is no more important time than right now to teach it because it is the emotional intelligence skills that make humans great partners with um, AI systems, you know, and, and to your point about this rate of change, I think it really is what makes um, humans and, and, and AI really thrive together because humans are going to spike always on the emotional intelligence part when mm -hmm. they learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So looking into the future, a lot of exciting things have happened to you in your life. You've had an incredible journey, incredible story. Where do you see the future lying for you, Rick? What does that look like? Well, um, I, have, I I wouldn't say I've really imagined a future, at least in my kind of like professional world where I'm not working on 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 Guru. Um, of course, you know, who, who knows, right? At Boomi, the, the, it was 13 years um, that I spent working in that world. But I do I do view it as, you know, a, a privilege to be able to work um, and 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 run the, the Guru business. Um, so within the context of that, I think that um the 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 best future that i think or 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 a way to think about how to have an impact in the future is to say that this problem of enabling employees to get that knowledge we talked about like the ceo example the support example the hr example if we can really move the needle if we can exponentially reduce that problem um, I think we will have made a mark in this transformation of the world kind of moving to AI. And that's, that's something that's a similar ambition that I felt like I had with my team at Boomi. Um, we would often talk about like, if, if, if our product can help cloud adoption at an industry level, that's how I think about it now. I think that that all of these AI systems that are coming to life inside of companies um, all live and die on the quality and accuracy of the knowledge and the data that they need to access and use in order to do what they do. And so, you know, it is not just that Guru wants to be, you know, the one AI tool for a business to use and you don't need anything else. Instead, we think of it as our role in this new AI ecosystem is we are continuously improving the quality and the accuracy and the availability of knowledge and, and data around that knowledge that makes humans thrive, but also makes other AI systems thrive. So I think if we look back and it was like Guru was really a needle mover in that, um, that's, I think that's sort of a, a professional outcome I would be really, really excited about. Great. Rick, I had a great conversation with you. I want to thank you for your time. It's been exactly. very good. If if anybody wants to get in contact with you specifically, how what's the best way to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our, we are at uh, getguru.com. And uh, to connect with me personally, LinkedIn would probably be the most uh, efficient way to do that. And I am just uh, Rick Nucci. As you'll find me, uh, you'll find me on, on LinkedIn. Okay. Rick, thank you again for your time. Love to come back and talk to you again, because I think there's going to be a lot of change between AI and emotional intelligence taking hold in every business. I'd love, love to love the, love the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Hi, Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this implementers video. The Implementers Podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.